Appreciate you joining us again for the next lesson uh, in our series, looking at the book of Isaiah. Whenever we consider such studies, we want to remember the words of Paul in Romans chapter 15 and verse 4, remembering that the things written before time are written for our learning. I'm a, a, a believer in the fact that we cannot, one cannot fully understand the New Testament without understanding much of what we see here in the Old Testament. We see the nature of God, the nature of sin. We see so many things develop. We look at the prophecies uh, that, that we're looking at uh, in this material. And we learn so much more about these things. We're going to approach chapter 2 here in just a moment. And we're going to slow down just a little bit through there, just enough to understand what is said in the New Testament that is so key in the fulfillment of that passage and so many others like them? Kingdom prophecy is a powerful study, but it's a study that continues to be needed today as we look at many who have misconceptions about the kingdom and about the church and about establishment and fulfillment, nature, so many things about it because they don't fully understand the Old Testament as it relates to these passages and looking at the, at, at the particular concepts that are addressed so clearly and made so much more clear as we move through these. In our last lesson, we were looking back at chapter 1, verses 10 through 15, and we saw, first of all, the sick worship that was characterizing Judah at the time that Isaiah prophesied. They were doing what God had commanded. We emphasized that to a major extent last week. They were doing exactly what God commanded, but their attitude wasn't right. They were going through the motions, and they thought that their worship was acceptable because they were doing the law itself, the factual acts, mm -hmm. but their heart was not near where it needed to be. Their attitude was all wrong. We address John chapter 4, verse 24, when Jesus was talking at the, at the well to the Samaritan woman. She was confused about what she had heard about worship. Her fathers had indicated the need to worship on Mount Gerizim, but then she indicated she had been taught something else. You say it needs to be on, on Zion or in Jerusalem. Jesus indicated the time was coming when it's not going to be in either mountain, but True worshipers would worship God in spirit and in truth. The truth is just one aspect of that worship. Attitude is so much more key. Then in verses uh, 16 and 17, we started the, the, the next section of the book where Jerusalem is indicted. That goes all the way down through the end of the chapter. But in verses 16 and 17, we find the call to repentance. And then we're, remember, nine different commands that were given in those two chapters that were so key for them to understand. Repentance is something that is not a one-time act, especially as we move into the New Testament and see what, what, what it means there. It's a change of heart that leads to a change of direction, a change of action. Again, we use the illustration of starting with a point of God and sin is that which is departing from God. If we're going to repent, we have to stop that departing path, acknowledge that we're wrong, and then come back and begin doing what's right. A two-step process that is not just a one-time act. It's our whole lives that we live in attempting to be penitent people. So let's begin here in verses 18 to 20 with the phrase, come and let us reason together. Come now and let us reason together, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are red like crimson, they shall be as wool. If you are willing and obedient, you shall eat the good of the land. But if you refuse and rebel, you shall be devoured by the sword. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. Oh, there's some powerful statements that we read. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. In other words, these things are the way they're going to be 
because God is controlled. God is sovereign. God has authority in all these matters. Now, when he said, come and let us reason together, he's not talking about a democratic debate. He's not talking about sitting down and, and, and arguing one's own points back and forth or defending one's view there. He was calling for them to make a decision, reason together based on God's will and God's reason. If we're going to be children of God, and if they were going to receive the benefits that were promised children of God, then they were going to have to understand and grasp the will of God for that to occur. So that's what he was asking for them to reason, and that is his will, his approach, his way, and our responsibility to it. He was calling for them to make a decision whether to serve him or to continue in the path of unfaithfulness that they were on. We've already indicated that for uh, Israel, excuse me, yeah, for Israel, the 10 northern tribes, it was already too late, pretty much. It was only about 20 years till God was going to vent his wrath on them through the means of Assyria and that captivity. But for those in the southern two tribes, Judah, was indeed to make a choice to follow him. Along these lines, we remember so well the words of Joshua regarding who they were to choose. If you want to choose the gods that were on the side of the river, but for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. That is exactly what God was calling for for Judah, for them to make the decision to follow him as it relates to his will in worship his will in a penitent spirit, his will in so many other ways of life. And they were rejecting all of those at the present time. And we're going to see as we move on down into the end of the chapter that God promises bad things for them if they continue on that course. God is a God of love. He is a God of mercy. He is a God of grace, but he's a God of justice and holiness as well. If he's going to reward those who do his will, then likewise he must punish those who do not do his will. That's part of the very fabric of the nature, the characteristics of God. It's not based on God just doing things on a whim either. God is always constant. He's always true. He doesn't change. The book of Hebrews bears that out in such a powerful fashion. But if people do not seek his will, then likewise they must understand that they have to face the consequences. He was offering them pardon here. He was offering them an opportunity to have their lives cleansed. The idea of consent and willing here also is a key concept. If you are willing and obedient, then you shall eat the fruit. That word willing is an interesting word because of the influence and the impact of Calvinism on the world today. Because you see, they indicate that man doesn't have a will regarding salvation. That man can do nothing to save himself. It all has to come from God. Calvin's belief was that because of the sin of Adam, that all men are born corrupt. All men are born depraved and can't do anything to save themselves. That has even resulted in a belief by some that when you're born, you're either saved or lost, and there's nothing you can do to alter any one of those two courses. That is not what the Bible teaches. That is not what we see. God said, if you're willing and obedient, if you're willing to do what I tell you to do, then you're going to enjoy the fruit of the land. You're going to be blessed in the way that God intended for them to be blessed, but they had to choose to do so. We understand that man was born as a free moral agent. In other words, we have the right, the ability. Let me, let me change that word. We have the ability and the freedom to choose which way we want to go. We can either choose to obey God. We can either choose to heed his will or we can choose to go our own way and attempt to supplement or, or replace God with something else. That's exactly what these people had been doing with their idolatry. 
They were saying no thanks to God. And they had the freedom to make that choice because of the way that God provided us. But free moral agency does not mean that we do not have to face consequences. Because with that choice comes dealing with the circumstances of the choices that we make. We see the same thing today. We, have, we, we, we can behave as we want to in society today. We, we can either obey the law or we can violate the law. We can obey the law and stay in good standing, or we can violate the law and reap the consequences of that action. The law is not at fault if I wind up going to jail, not on the ideal. I know there are corruptions, and, and, and that this illustration is not designed to deal with the corruptions that we see in the system. But it's the same way with God as far as that goes. We have the right, and we can choose to violate his will if we so choose, but then we have to realize the consequences of it. The law of sowing and reaping portrayed throughout scripture, as a man sows, that shall he also reap. We can't blame God if eternal life is not ours. We cannot blame God if we have to deal with horrific consequences that are a result of God's will as we have the right and the ability to choose. Then in verses 21 to 23, we see the outline of the uh, details, more details, specifics about the indictment. How the faithful city has become a harlot. It was full of justice, righteousness lodged in it, but now murderers. Your silver has become dross, your wine mixed with water. Your princes are rebellious and companions of thieves. Everyone loves bribes and follows after rewards. They do not defend the fatherless, nor does the cause of the widow come before them. These verses all give the specifics of God's indictment against Judah. Let's Let's portray this as we might understand, as far as the illustration goes, the grand jury today. We can be called before the grand jury if there's enough evidence for the grand jury to call in that sense. Judah is about to be judged, and clearly there is more than sufficient evidence for God to bring down his judgment on them. It's going to happen in the form of Babylon eventually. As we're going to see, just as Assyria was carried off, Babylon is, going to, uh, Babylon is going to carry Jerusalem away. Horrific times. And not attempting to be cold-natured, but they asked for it. It was their fault that all those things occurred. God had sent prophet after prophet to deal with these people. They had received warning after warning and appeal after appeal to come back to God. And yet they were doomed to repeat the mistakes of the ten northern tribes, the same problem of idolatry. But what we're going to see, idolatry was not the cause of their problem. Idolatry was a result of the problem. Let's continue as we look at that. He addresses these consequences in the form of a contrast between the way they used to be and the way they were at that time or the way that they had become at the time of Isaiah's prophecy. The faithful city had become a harlot. Strong language indeed. This is reference to spiritual adultery. Their idolatry was spiritual adultery, but there was something wrong with the heart that had them to seek these idols. You see, that's where the problem was. It began inside. It began with their heart. And the outward manifestation of an impure heart were the idols that they formed for themselves and the false worship that they used in regard to those idols. It would be easy to say it was the idol's fault. The idols direct me down that path. They can't do that because they weren't ignorant. God had revealed his will. God had told them the things that he wanted them to do. 
Yes, maybe the priests were falling down on the job as we reference and as we see in the book of Hosea. But that does not absolve anyone of the responsibility themselves to pay attention to what they had heard. This was not the first year in a classroom. They had been around. They knew what the law was. The point is they didn't care. They did care at one point. They were doing right at one point. That's what's addressed here. You see, the faithful city had become a harlot. Those who were spiritually pure had become spiritual adulterers. Israel had deserted her husband, God. They had once been full of justice was the next point that Isaiah addressed. The word justice refers to the verdict of a judge. It speaks of a judge's duty to arrive at the truth through investigation and then render a decision, either vindicating someone or condemning them based upon what they saw in the evidence. When I think of this and I think of application for us today, I'm reminded of the words of Christ recorded in John chapter 12, verses 48 to 50. The word that I have spoken will judge you in the last day. All authority had been given to him. He was speaking God's word. And that word, not man's opinion of it, not a word that somebody else produces, that word is what's going to be used at the judgment of man. When I stand before God at the judgment, I can't throw excuses around. It's all going to boil down to, did I align myself with God's will with the proper attitude? It really is as simple as that, though oftentimes it's so much more difficult to actually implement that in our lives. Satan continues to work. I do believe God wants us in heaven more than Satan wants us in hell because of the price God paid for us to be able to do so. But it's going to take responsibility to that will. It's going to take our choosing his path rather than insisting upon our own. In addition to justice, righteousness once lodged in Jerusalem as well. Righteousness is strictly based on the character of, and the revelation of God. Things are right because God said so. We are in a right relationship with God because God sets the parameters and then makes his decision based upon the parameters that he's established for us. You see, the standard that God provides us is not just an ethical code. Yes, it does involve ethics. It involves morality. It, it, it involves doctrinal soundness and purity. But the standard that God uses is all based on his character, the attributes that make him what he is. You see, it's not just an ethical code that we learn. It's learning about God that is so key for us in these things. What once was seen as precious silver regarding Judah is now base. The New King James Version says it's dross. It's useless. The beauty of silver and the horrible nature of the opposite. That which was pure had become impure. No, not because of somebody outside, not because of something outside, because the people had chosen impurity rather than choosing to maintain purity. Verses 24 through 31, as we wind up this chapter, show the consequences of Jerusalem's indictment. Let's go ahead and read 24 through 31. Therefore, the Lord says, the Lord of hosts, the mighty one of Israel, ah, I will rid myself of my adversaries and take vengeance on my enemies. I will turn my hand against you and thoroughly purge away your dross and take away all your alloy. I will restore your judges as at the first and your counselors as at the beginning. Afterward, you shall be called the city of righteousness, the faithful city. Zion shall be redeemed with justice and her penitents with righteousness. 
The destruction of transgressors and of sinners shall be together, and those who forsake the Lord shall be consumed. For they shall be ashamed of the terebinth trees which you have desired, and you shall be embarrassed because of the gardens which you have chosen. For you shall be as a terebinth whose leaf fades, and as a garden that has no water. The strong shall be as tender, and the work of it as a spark. Both will burn together, and no one shall quench them. Do we begin to see why some people do not enjoy a study of the Old Testament. It is, it is difficult. It is dark sometimes. It shows a side of God that people don't like to think about. We all want to think about the love and grace and mercy of God. I've even heard those who try to differentiate between the God of the Old Testament and the God of the New Testament. They'll say the God of the New Testament is the God of grace and mercy and love. And that the God of the Old Testament is the God of punishment and conviction and horrors. We need to see just the opposite. The very fact that God sent another prophet to pull them away from what was separating them from God, God through Isaiah was offering one more opportunity through his mercy and grace, to give them one more opportunity to repent and to return to him. We think about prophets such as Jeremiah. Jeremiah prophesied about 40 years. And we often hear him characterized as one who, in preaching for 40 years, never got a, pos a positive response to his message. It was harsh. It was difficult. He told them about captivity and how long they were going to be in captivity, but he also told them why they went, seeking to get them to come back. God was using Jeremiah for that very thing, and yet the people failed to do so. The final portion of this chapter lists the consequences that are to follow the indictment by God. It speaks of redemption, but it also speaks of punishment. They would realize that that benefit, blessing, or consequences, judgment, was totally based on their response to Isaiah's message. In other words, whether they were blessed or whether they were condemned, was not dependent upon God. God had laid it out. God had given them everything that they need. It was dependent upon them and how they sought to obey, to apply, to implement God's word in their lives. The use of the word Adonai there appears only a few times in Isaiah. And one commentator indicated that it's used only in reference to the threats from God. It seems to have to do with the power of God. The word Yahweh that's used in relation to God shows God's sovereignty and his power and absolute rule over his people. Yahweh is the covenant name for God. But it's a covenant that is based strictly upon the stipulations that God as sovereign placed upon it. We don't have a say. Man does not have a say in this covenant. God in the place of authority has the right to set the parameters of that covenant. And he did so in three different covenants. He established parameters for those under patriarchal law. He established guidelines, set of rules for those under Mosaic law. And he's done the same thing with us today. He hasn't changed in that sense. Yes, the particulars of the covenants have changed, but the right to extend the covenant continues to be with God. The right to establish the parameters of the covenant rests solely upon God. And man's state, the end result, is simply going to be based upon what we did with what God had established as far as the guidelines. I consider, I continue to be concerned 
about the religious world today. I see so many people seeking to implement their own will for these things. And oftentimes, they'll even attempt to change the nature of God in order to do so. God knows my heart. God wouldn't want me to do without this or that or the other. Surely God wouldn't condemn us over this or that. When in reality, we know that speaks directly against the character of God. God wants us to be happy. Yes, he does. God wants us to be in heaven. Yes, he does. He wants to shower us with blessings. But we have to reach out and choose that way. The words in verses 24 and 25 all speak about God's judgment of the nation of Israel because of their sins. After his judgment, the remnant is going to be restored into the land. Now, again, we know that that occurs about 536 B.C. The remnant begins to come back. After the ten northern tribes have been carried away, after the two southern tribes are carried into, into Babylonian captivity, Isaiah indicated it was 70 years manifesting a complete period of time. But then God also promised that the remnant was going to be saved. There was still more to be done. The seed promise to Abraham was still to be fulfilled. As we move to the end of the Old Testament, that seed promise had yet to be fulfilled. Oh, they're told about it in prospect. They're promised that the Messiah is coming. That's the words that Malachi closes Old Testament revelation with. One like Elijah is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. Oh, what a powerful promise. But also how so many people misunderstood what that was. We'll get to that sometime later. We haven't changed regarding misapplying and twisting God's word to fit our own ideas of the way that we think things need to be. As we continue to move through the book of Isaiah, the theme, the concept of of a remnant, restoration, becomes even more dominant. When we begin looking at chapter 2, and it's probably going to be next week, next time, before we can address that, we'll see how this goes. Isaiah chapter 2 has a great deal to say about what occurred on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2. As a matter of fact, in preparation for that, if you would, Read Luke chapter 24, verses 44 to 47, and then read Acts chapter 2, at least the first half of the chapter. And that'll prepare us for understanding even more of what Isaiah, what Isaiah was prophesying of as we move into that chapter. We're going to see so much about the last days and, oh, how the religious world misunderstands the last days today. Horrible consequences of disobedience and idolatry were emphasized as we move through this chapter. God chose his, chose his people over all other nations. But God's people responded by choosing oaks and gardens instead of the Lord. Now, as we wind this up, I want us to look at chapter 2. And verse 1, we've got about a minute and a half to complete this. Because in reality, chapter 2, verse 1, really goes on the end of the first chapter. The word that Isaiah, the son of Amos, saw concerning Judah and Jerusalem. Could it be any more plain who he was talking about? He was talking about the tribe of Judah, which is the two, the nation of Judah, which, which consists of Judah and Benjamin there. But Judah is so key because Judah ha continues to have a place, a role to serve in God's plan. You see that promise to David in 2 Samuel chapter 7 about uh, a, a, a pure line being tied to the one who would sit on David's throne, the Messiah. It's promised, but it's not fulfilled yet. Judah is still going to be used and that's what he begins to address here. This may very well mark the beginning of the prophecies. And chapter 1 to this point has served primarily as an introduction. 
The Hebrew word for saw in this verse is the same as we saw back in chapter 1 and verse 1. It simply means perceived by revelation. We excuse me. I'm going to stop this timer. I want to continue my thought here as we close this out. Just another minute or two. What Isaiah spoke of in those first four and, 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 and verses, really verses two through four, and that'll receive the bulk of our time next week. He was shown these things. He was given this message, this information. That is the very core of prophecy. The prophet is speaking God's word, not his own. Isaiah's ministry was directed to Judah and to Benjamin. As I said, the northern kingdom was in its fading days. It's going to be destroyed by Assyria in 722 B.C., not even 20 years from when Isaiah began. Thankful for your interest in the study of God's Word. I hope that you're benefiting from understanding these things. I understand that it's a dark message, and I won't apologize for that, as God is very clear here. He wants his people to see what's going to happen if they don't turn. May we realize the concept of choice as we continue to live our lives for him. Until next time, God bless you.